so let's continue. Um, what else did I want to say? Oh, yeah. I don't know. I don't see people talking to each other. I'm bored in the evening. So 8 o'clock in the lobby, if you want to come have a beer with me, I'll buy you beer. All right? <laughs> I don't know if I'm allowed to do that. So if I'm not allowed to do that, I didn't say that. But I'll still be in the lobby at 8 o'clock for mysterious reasons. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, so let's start. Um, so last time we started talking about optimize, uh, uh, about you know machine learning, and what we wanted to emphasize last time was the difference between predicting and fitting, right? And so I hope playing with the Python exercises, you saw that there's a subtlety in all this stuff. That we want to predict on data we haven't seen yet, but we get to only fit on the data we've already seen. Right? And that's going to come up again and again in what we do. And a lot of what you need to understand about m machine learning right now is how we do this. And so the plan for the class is basically um, for the lecture is I'm going to do it all on the blackboard. We'll go back to Python notebooks tomorrow in the morning. But to get you there, we have to understand the basic ingredients of how you do this kind of machine learning. And there's basically three things we have to understand. So there's basically four parts to a machine learning model. There is the optimizer, because remember, we have to minimize the training error in some way, or actually minimize the generalization error. But part of that is choosing parameters, and we do that by optimizing. And we'll talk about what that means. Then there is the cost function, which is how we measure how good we're doing. And then there is regularization, which is a little bit more subtle. But regularization is basically the idea that we get to see training data. But and that's m minimizing the error on the training data. But what we want to do is generalize well. What we want to minimize is, is the error on data we haven't seen yet. And in order to do that, remember what we saw last time is you can have overfitting. And so to take care of that difference in what I actually optimize and what I would like to optimize, you have to do something called regularization. That's the third component. And then the fourth component is basically how do we choose the model itself? Right? And modern deep learning is basically based around neural networks. Right? It's just uh, Jeff Hinton was, uh, wanted to rebrand neural networks because they were extremely unpopular, so he started calling them deep learning in the mid-2000s. Right? And then, because you know, as hard as it is to believe now, if you worked on, there were like five people left working on neural networks in the mid-2000s. Right? And everyone thought they should stop working on them and do support vector machines until 2012, until there was this amazing, there was amazing result called AlexNet. And that basically had to do with the fact that they put these neural networks on GPUs. Right? And if I have some time, I'll tell you about GPUs and computation. But we're not going to get into that right now. So let's go through all these. Uh, let's go through all this together. And so as I said before, right? we have these two functions we care about. E training, right, which is measured by some cost function, right, uh, where you just basically look. Oh, wow, I'm making a lot of noise. And you have some other thing you care about, which we're going to say is test, but it's not really test. It's the error on a typical piece of data I see otherwise. Right? And I have some parameters that I have to choose. And again, I want to emphasize the subtlety. I keep writing these things that are completely redundant over and over again, because by basically saying is, I have access to this, but I care about that. But we know that if this is terrible, this is also going to be terrible. Right? This is necessary 
you have to be at least pretty good at this. Otherwise, you're never going to be able to predict any, on anything new. So the question is, how do we optimize and choose these parameters? Right? And the trick of modern neural networks, what's really important, and I would argue, is that there's two basic things that happened in the last 15 years that are completely surprising. One is that if you talked, read the old neural network literature when it was really unpopular, I would say 2010, 2009, back when I started as a faculty member. What they kept telling you is that we just don't have big enough computers or big enough data sets. Yeah, and that actually turned out to be true. So the first thing that has made this easy is that GPUs are the size of the data sets. So this is, you know, computation. But the second thing that is kind of surprising, and I think I, I would argue that no one really still understands, is the surprising power of differentiability especially in high dimensions okay and by that I mean is that you would think it would be really hard to learn a map from a million dimensional space to another million dimensional space but actually if you regularize, or if you use the fact the thing you try to learn is essentially differentiable, it turns out you can do this quite easily. And so this kind of differentiable architecture is key to understanding what's going on. And so the kind of optimizations techniques I use really assume that these kind of models that I have, I can take derivatives with respect to the parameters easily. Right? So this key to this, right? This is the key to, I would say, the real key to all this, and we don't really understand, is the idea is that we want to optimize by taking derivatives. And so for that reason, I'm going to focus on optimization optimizers that are based on taking derivatives. And we'll see what we really want to be able to do is take derivatives and then use the chain rule. All right? And derivatives plus the chain rule is back propagation. That's what the you know, famous algorithm that was discovered in the 80s, but it's really no one really appreciated how powerful differentiability was. And I would argue we still don't really understand why once you make things differentiable, you can learn these maps from super high dimensional spaces in a way that you know, if you made me guess even a decade ago, it would have been really surprising. I mean, to everyone, everyone. I think Jeff and Jan were the only people who actually believed <laughs> that this was possible. <laughs> All right, so let's begin. So generally, what we're going to be interested in is that we're going to have some cost function or some error function and I'm going to use, you know, instead of using C, I'm going to use E for all this stuff. But the important point is that the error functions generally have a very special form, which is that they're usually sums of individual errors for each of the training data points. Right? So the training function, like think about least squared regression, right? In least squared regression, I do yi minus my prediction squared. But the important point is that it's a sum over individual training points, training data points, right? It's the error on each data point, and then you sum it up. Is everyone OK with what's going on? OK. So this is going to play an important role in what follows in a second, right? And now I just want to minimize this error function. So right now, let's think of this as an optimization problem. So how do I optimize this with respect to some theta? Right? Say, I, say I wanted to optimize parameters. right? So what I want to do is I want to iteratively update 
my parameters theta. Right? So given some parameters at theta t minus 1, I want to update them to theta t. And the basic idea is that I want to do this with gradient descent. Right? So I want to do this with differentiable things, because somehow differentiability seems to be the key to all this. All right? So how do I do this? Well, it's pretty easy. One thing I can do, right, and I'm going to try to establish some notation, is I can create, I can basically calculate, apparently, apparently that is not going to, I, I'm going to keep using this over and over again until, unless I move this over here. Oh, it sticks on, oh, how clever. There's Velcro. <laughs> oh, then you can wash them? Oh, wow. Korean technology. <laughs> so one thing I can do is just calculate the gradient, right? And I can update Let me see. Minus infinity. All right. So I have some function I'm trying to minimize. I take the gradient, and I just update the gradient equations. Right? And I've introduced this very important parameter that's going to play a very important role in all this stuff. This a to the t, and this is called the learning rate. Right? So this is the dumbest thing I could do. I just take my energy function, I take a gradient, I go in the direction that minimizes it, iteratively. So what's the learning rate mean? Why do I need this parameter called the learning rate? Why do you think? Yeah, so generically, right, I, I think the, I didn't have to do that. I'm confused about the boards. But, you know, generically, I have a complex thing. The gradient only gives me local information. So I only want to make local moves in my parameter space. So the gradient in general, the learning rate controls how much do I move. How seriously do I take these things? All right. So generically, the idea is that these landscapes are complicated, and they're also in high dimensions. All right. So if I'm doing just optimization, generally I don't do gradient descent. I do something called Newton's method. How many of you have heard of Newton's method? Raise your hand. How many people know Newton's method? Some of you, OK. So what's Newton's method do? How is Newton's method different from this? Here, I just used the first derivative. What does Newton's method do? Who wants to tell me what I use in the Newton's method? I don't just use the first derivative. What do I use? The what? Yeah, well, this is also a linearization, but you use this is the first derivative, right? So I'm just. Saying, what I'm saying here, maybe, is I'm saying e theta is approxim you know, approximately e theta plus delta theta is approximately e of theta plus delta theta times gradient of e. And what would be the next term in this thing? What would I have? Yeah, you'd have the Hessian, right? That just measures the curvature. So what Newton's method says is, don't do this simple thing here. Instead, what I should do is I should now use this update. Vt is equal to h inverse theta t, where h is the same Hessian that appeared up here, del theta of e, 
And then I do the same update. All right. And did I mess up some signs? Oh, I don't know why there's this minus sign here. <laughs> OK, so I, I do this thing. And instead of a learning rate, I've used a Hessian. What's the advantages of this Newton's method? What do I get? Why do I, if I'm just doing optimization and it's easier to calculate the Hessian, do I use, do I use this Newton's method? What's the intuition? Sorry? It's, it's, it's defining variance, is that what you said? Yeah, in some sense it measures, you know, local curvature, right? And one of the things it does is that it treats different directions in different ways, right? So the problem in high dimensions is I hear the learning rate, I take steps, and I take steps in all directions exactly the same. But generically, in these high dimensional landscapes, you have some directions that are narrow, other directions that are really big. We don't want, so what this does is it adapt, you could think of this as adapting the step size, right? So this sets the step size, the learning rate. And what the Newton's method does is it says, oh no, I'm going to adapt how much I walk in these different directions based on second derivative information. So we'd love to do that, right? And in particular, you know, in the one-dimensional problem, so right, uh, let me see where I, what I'll do. Yeah, I'll come back here and erase this, right? If I have a quadratic potential, right, then I know that the optimum Learning rate, right? So imagine this is just a quadratic potential. So this is just what every local minimum looks like. It's a quadratic. Then I know that the optimum learning rate looks just like the second derivative to the inverse. And in particular, what happens is that if I have n is less than n optimum, You basically take little steps to reach the minimum, right? So if n is less than n optimum, if I do gradient descent, right? And everyone sees that this is just the one dimensional version of this Newton's method up here, right? Because that's like the optimum thing. If n is equal to n optimum, then I just reach it in a single step. Right? If n is greater than n optimum, right? I need two more colors. Maybe I have them. All right. If n is greater than n optimum, but less than but less, and then finally I'm gonna have n is greater than two n optimum. What happens is that you can convince yourself, in this case, you just kind of bounce back and forth across here, but you still converge. But in this final case, if I make my learning rate too big, what's going to happen is you actually start diverging. You never converge. All right? So you become really, really sensitive to this learning rate. That's something you'll see over and over again. This is going to be our first example of what you call a hyperparameter which is a parameter that matters a lot whenever you're solving a hard machine learning problem and you have to sweep over it. And what's interesting is this is in one dimension, but I know I can just think about this in high dimensions. And in particular, you see that if I go back to this picture, maybe here. Oh, here, I want to show both the picture and this thing at the same time, but I'll just write it again. It's probably the best way to write it. If I look at what my gradient if I look at what my update is for, for um, Newton's method, you know that you can always diagonalize this Hessian. 
right? It's a, it's a symmetric matrix. You diagonalize it. And the eigenvalues, now the eigenvectors and the eigenvalue directions basically look like independent directions. Everyone okay with that intuition, right? You diagonalize. But then each independent direction is going to look like this, right? Because once I go to the diagonal basis, it's just n independent problems. But now you get into a big problem, right? Generically, you're going to be limited. You want to choose your learning rate smaller than the smallest eigenvalue. Otherwise, you're going to diverge in some directions and converge in other directions. Right? So that's why you're so sensitive to the learning rate. Because it basically sets a resolution. And in high dimensional spaces, you're going to have a distribution of eigenvalues. And you don't want to, and in some sense, you can always choose this smaller, but then it becomes computationally more expensive. Right? That's why we don't choose it really small. So there's all of these trade-offs. That's why we have to tune these hyperparameters so much. All right. So I would love to do this, but I can't. All right? So let's think about what's going on. So this is gradient descent. And what we're going to see is that gradient descent itself is not what anyone uses. Because it has some fundamental limitations. And some of them we can overcome with other things. And other things we can't, right? So let's think about why we can't just use gradient descent or Newton's method to optimize stuff. So Newton's method is the first thing you should ask is, if you're remotely computational, why don't I use Newton's method if I have millions of parameters? What's expensive? How many of you, you guys should I consider myself like a pure theorist, and even I know what's expensive. What's expensive in this method, computationally? Yeah, inverse. Because at each step, I have to invert like a million by million. It's actually much bigger than that. <laughs> it's not even computationally feasible. But even if it was a few hundred thousand, which is a small neural network, you'd have to invert a few hundred thousand by few hundred thousand matrix at every step. Too expensive. So, this kind of Newton's method, out from the beginning. Can't have big matrix inversions. But we still would like to adapt the learning rate. right? That's the intuition that you want to get from all this. On the other hand, we can think about gradient descent. And what's important is to understand the limitations of this gradient descent. So gradient descent seems great, but then you start, oh, this is going to be the bane of my existence. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Gradient descent. Um, so what are the limitations? In order to understand the in order to understand why people use the opti optimizers they do, it's good to understand what the limitations of gradient descent are. All right. So what so I've said them most of them throughout this talk. So who wants to tell me some of the limitations based on what we've been discussing so far? What, what we did this whole discussion, so someone tell me. What are the limitations? Uh, yeah, I mean, even without the matrix inverse, it's actually computationally intensive. Why is it computationally intensive? Because look at the error. It scales like the number of training data points. right? So you have to do a big sum that scales with a huge data set. So this is just computationally impossible. <laughs> this is what I would call computationally expensive. <laughs> right? So the first thing, we didn't really discuss it, is actually quite computationally expensive Because at each step, I have to do a sum over the number of training data sets. And as the training data set gets big, it gets really expensive. What's another thing that is a limitation of gradient descent? 
Yeah, another thing we didn't talk about, but for sure is true, is that you can get tracked in, tracked in local minima and not global minima, right? And for a long time, people have been thinking about, well, I erased the very complicated thing, but in general, you know, you have a very complicated thing. I need to make the learning rate small, but if, I, if the learning rate is small, then I get trapped in local minima. Turns out the intuition is that most local minima that are reasonable are pretty good. That's one of the interesting things about deep learning and why modern statistics fails, but you do get trapped in local minima. Okay, what else? How about in high dimensions? What was the point that we were saying about this Hesse? What is one of the things Newton's method in principle fixes? What do I say about different directions? So I have many, many directions. How does gradient descent treat them all? Yeah, it treats them all the same. But we know that there's no reason to assume you have uniformity. But a lot of tricks are also about making this thing. So gradient descent also treats all directions the same. So that's kind of annoying. And the last thing is that that graph says is that it's also very sensitive to the learning rate. So in practice, it's true that if you have infinite amount of time, the best thing is really playing with the learning rate and doing, well, not gradient descent, but stochastic gradient descent, which we'll get to in a second. But in practice, what you want is some stuff that works off the shelf. So no one ever actually uses gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent for the first time to train something until they have some reasonable tuning of all the other hyperparameters, but we'll get to that, right? So we'd like something like gradient descent that fixes as many of these problems as I can. This is never going to be able to be fixed by any local gradient derivative-based function, so we can just throw that out, right? And then we're going to use, try to fix all these things, right? So the first thing that turns out to be true, and at first was thought to be just a trick for fixing computational problems, but turns out to actually work much better than gradient descent in practice, is something called stochastic gradient descent, right? And this is the workhorse Ah. All right. All right. So, none of these algorithms is ever used. What is used in practice is something called stochastic gradient descent. I can't spell. or SGD, as it's commonly known. And SGD is something that has its origins as a computational strip, trick slash something, another field of machine learning called online learning. But in the end, it turned out that this actually works much, much better for a reason we'll come back to. That has to do with the thing I keep emphasizing, that you have access to one thing, but you're actually trying to generalize, optimize another thing, right? training test. So what you do in stochastic gradient descent is instead of taking, oh, uh, that's hidden, isn't it? Uh, OK, I'm not going to do it there. I need this board. <laughs> so I, what I'll do is I'll erase this board. So what you do with SGD is you say, OK, here's all these training data points. All right? And then you say, look, I'm working with E-train, but I really care about something else, which is you know, E-generalization. So it doesn't really matter if I get this error function exactly right. Because this is just an approximation for something I can't measure anyway. 
Every, everyone see that, that that's the fundamental thing? I can't measure what I want off of. So what I do is something dumb. I say, instead of using all the training data, let me make something called a mini batch. All right. And the idea is that a mini batch, it's a word you should know, just like you should know learning rate. Right? A mini batch is, let me take this training data, and let me just take some small amount of training data. Say, like, say, 128 of these, of order 100 data points. And actually, the mini batch size doesn't seem to depend on the amount of training data you have. It's not extensive, which I've spent way too much time thinking about why and never came up with a good answer. All right? And then what I do is I divide my whole training data set you know, how big it is, into little batches. So I have batch one, batch two, batch three, all the way to whatever batch, the total training data size divided by B, right? So I have uh, whatever, batch, how many ever batches you have. So you have 100, 1 to 100, 100 to 200, 200 to 300, whatever, and what I do is instead of taking the gradient over the whole thing, I take the gradient over a mini batch. All right? So at each step, what I do is I just say, okay, I'm going to use the same algorithm here, but now I'm going to just replace it. by a mini batch. And not only am I going to do that, I'm just going to go through. At the first step, I'm going to use the first mini batch. At the second step, I'm going to use the second mini batch in the gradient descent. Next, I'll use this mini batch, and I just go through. And this, once you go through a whole thing, it's usually called an epic. An epic is when you go through the whole gradient the whole data set once. So what does this mini batch, what does this SGD do? Right? First of all, you see that at each step, I'm taking a gradient of a different function. Right? Because, and it's really, if you think about it, this is really, really small. Right? It's really weird because it's such a sparse, Horrible, noisy sample. Right? In some sense, I say, I, oh, maybe this is what I really care about, but I'm going to estimate it with this kind of horrible, noisy thing. But actually, the noise helps you. That's one of the big lessons. Why does the noise help you, you think? Who said that? What? what? Who? Yeah, it's some kind of regularization. Again, the point is, I don't care about this. I care about that. And by making it noisier, I'm basically taking out these non-generic features of the training data. So at first, people thought it was just a computational trick. But in practice, it turns out to be way better than gradient descent, even if you could do the computation, even on small data sets. Because this is our first example of something that serves as a form of what we're calling this, which is regularization, which is that I need tricks because I don't want to over-optimize for E-train. What I care about is about E-general. All right? So SGD is the workhorse of modern machine learning because I also need differentiability for reasons we'll talk about. Everyone okay with that? So learn these words, epic, learning rate, mini batch. All right, everyone, everyone have those words? All right. So that solved, you know, this problem. And, it add, and we got a bonus, right? The special bonus, I, there was yellow chalk, but I can't find it. You got a bonus. 
regularization. Right? Generalize is better. Because I'm basically shaking, I mean, one way of thinking about it is that I'm shaking up the potential. Each time it's slightly different. And you're averaging out all the noise, right? And keeping everything. I can shake some more if it'll make people laugh. You guys are like a very somber crowd. <laughs> very, 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 very subdued. Can I have a yeah, of course. Can we raise the fee for choosing optimal uh, number of mini batches? Generally, it turns out that you choose of order 100. So anywhere between 30 to 150, but you don't want it to be extensive in the size of the data set. No, no one knows. Open question. Seems to depend on the application. Depends very strongly on the learning rate. Too big is bad. So really, you want to put the noise in, because that regularizes. That seems to be true. So it's always chosen of order 100. It's also, you understand that machine learning is a lot like alchemy, or for this audience, biology. If it works, you just keep doing it. You don't ask. It's like, if you, I don't know if you've ever talked to experimental labs. You ask why things are done. They said, because it's always done and it always works. Right? So machine learning has a lot of dogma. A lot of dogma. We don't know why. We just know it works. It's not clear anything is the best solution, even though you'll see a 30 paper saying it's the best solution. Because like, Four years later, someone will come up with another solution. So it's really, it's empirical. It's, I, I would say it's like, it's like alchemy, right? We have rules of thumb, a lot of guesses. We don't really understand very basic things, I would say. <laughs> that's, that's my guess. But it works. It's a great tool. So yeah? I'm sorry, can you, can you say louder? Okay. I'll use what you first use the first mini batch for the first gradient. The next time you take the gradient, you go to the next mini batch. Next time you take the gradient, you go to the next mini batch. So you move it each time you're actually taking the gradient with respect to a different potential. And then you just cycle through the whole data set. That's an epic. And you usually do multiple epics 10, 20. We'll see this tomorrow when we run our Python notebook. So instead of using mini batch, why, why can't we just do adding the uh, Gaussian noise. Like yeah, because Gaussian noise seems. He has a lot of physicists spent a lot of time on that. But it's because the nature of the noise is very different. This seems to how you know, it's not white noise, right? Um, and this noise seems to work better than, than, than just adding Langevin noise, which is uncolored. In some sense, the idea is that this noise knows about the correlation structure, right? Because it knows about the correlation structure of the energy landscape. Whereas white noise doesn't. So somehow I think it has something to do with the fact that we'll come to the next thing, which is that even your noise, you don't want it to treat all directions in the same way. <laughs> and you can see that this is going to be colored noise. <laughs> and it's going to know something about the, right? The noise is going to be larger in some sense in the directions that are less constrained, just intuitively. <laughs> If I have some flat directions, those are the, in my minima space, those are the directions where you're going to get the most variation. That's, that's basically the idea. Try to make that into a rigorous thing. Never works. I have tons of calculations I've done. They work on like three numerical experiments and fail on the next three. You know, it's like, <laughs> it's very hard <laughs> to make this into a rigorous theory. All right. Um, sorry, I have to see what I'm going next. Okay. Um, so that's stochastic gradient descent. But in practice, often what people want to do is they want to actually, you know, they want, especially when you're doing initial explorations, you want an optimizer that kind of solves these things. I don't want it to be super sensitive to the learning rate because I'll never find it. I want to basically know, is my network pretty good before I start optimizing everything? Right? So in practice, what people do is they've come up with what they'd like to do is up here in Newton's method, but it's too expensive. Too expensive. Don't want to do matrix inverses. But I would still like to you know, fix some of these things. I'd like to have something that's not that sensitive to what my hyperparameters are, that actually treats different directions differently. So people have come up with what are called essentially um, 
you know, different, different, different things. And so there's two basic tricks that people use. Right? So one basic thing about, you know, not getting stuck in too small a local minima is people usually you add something called momentum. And the basic idea now is instead of, once again, you take the mini batch. Right? But now what you do is instead of just updating it all the gradient in this way, uh, is that you give things inertia. Right? So the basic idea is um, what you do is you give, uh, let me see, did I write that right? Uh, I did. Um, so what you do is you basically give things inertia, right? So they keep moving in the direction you were giving, you were moving in. Somehow that equation doesn't look right to me. Hold on. Uh, I, I hate writing on the board. Sometimes it's so confusing. <laughs> Give me one second. I want to write something. I feel like I'm doing something silly. This is the bad part of doing everything off the top of your head. The good part is it makes a better lecture. The bad part is when you get confused. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's something wrong about what I wrote down, right? Uh, B T. Oh no, I, this is why I wrote it down wrong. It doesn't make any sense what I wrote. The momentum is not there. The momentum is here. What you do is you take the gradient. And instead of changing it all at once, you, the gradient keeps on going in the direction it's going. And then you update a little bit, right? And alpha is a parameter between 0 and 1. Right? Instead of just saying, oh, I move in the direction of the local gradient, I'm averaging the gradient over some time period that's set by alpha. <laughs> yeah? Sorry? Um, it is just, um, it's usually chosen, there's some convention, I forget. It's the default, it's the, it's the, it's the, it's the def, I don't actually, I have, again, let me write this. Let me use standard notation so I can do it. You do this, usually, okay? And gamma is just the time step, it's usually chosen to be 0.7 or something like that. In every machine learning package, they'll tell you what gamma is, and there's a default. I think no one touches it. <laughs> All right, there's some best rule of thumb. Who knows if it's the best, but no one touches it, right? But the important point is it's just rem you remember the gradient over some time period, right? Because you have the last time, and you see this 1 over gamma is basically setting a time period on which you remember things, right? And the point of this is that we know what momentum does in a ball. If I have a little hill like this and I'm moving, momentum will get, get me out of these little tiny shallow local minima. All right, everyone okay with, with that? Okay, so that's the first trick, but that still doesn't solve the problem of treating all the directions in the same, dire in the same, in the same way, right? And so what people call the, so this is SGD with momentum. And so what people do is what are called second order moment second moment approximations. And what this, these are, is they're a way to try to implement um, Hessians without calculating the full matrix of derivatives. And the most famous one, the one that is the default uh, everyone uses, is something called um, Adam, but there's also another one which is very common, which is called RMS prop. I think much more likely is 
Much more, nowadays I see much more atom used than everything else. Okay? All right, so the default that people go to, if I, if, when you, you'll see that most people use, is this atom. Right. So what is the idea of these atom and RMS prop? Right? So the basic idea is not only do I keep track of the mean, right? So here I'm just taking care, track, taking track of the gradient. I also take, uh, I also keep track of the variance of the gradient. All right. And so the simplest version is something like this. So I have to write it. Uh, I forgot that I wouldn't have a printer here. <laughs> so let me write down some gradient, which is del theta mini batch. Then I basically write down a moment, m of t is equal to m beta m. These are standard notation, so that's why I'm trying to use standard notation. One minus beta. Yeah. And then I take care of S of T. G of T squared. This. And then I write, uh, it's not going to be really important for all this stuff. And then, roughly speaking, spiritually speaking, what I do now is I say that theta t plus 1 is equal to theta t minus the moment uh, minus eta t over m of t over s of t plus epsilon. All right? So this is basically what's going on. So let's, let's walk through these equations. They look very annoying and confusing. Um, but they're very straightforward to understand. All right? So this was just the stochastic gradient descent that we already saw. There's one very clever trick in this, and it doesn't work otherwise. Okay? This is just, again, just keeping track of the gradient with momentum. Right? So this is saying, okay, my best estimate for the gradient is whatever gradient I got, weighted by whatever momentum I had before at the time step before. Does everyone understand that? This is just averaging. So now I average. I don't update it all at once. I keep track. I'm averaging over multiple time points set by beta inverse. Then here, I'm only, not only keeping track of the mean, but I'm also keeping track of the gradient squared. All right? So this is like the variance, right? This is how much things fluctuate. And then what I do, right, is I basically now update my moment, my parameters by the gradient, which is the mean, divided by something like the standard deviation. Right? This you can think of as like trying to estimate the variance of the gradient. Right? Because it's the second order fluctuation. This is trying to estimate the mean. And the basic idea is now I should step in an adaptive way such that I move the mean divided by the standard deviation because that's the dimensionless unit that makes sense. So the standard deviation basically tells me what the natural unit is. And this mean basically allows you to step in that direction, right? So what MT should I take seriously? The ones that are much, much bigger than the variance. Right? So it's almost like moving in z-score. And this is another trick in machine learning all the time that you see over and over again. This is what batch normalization is. All these fancy words, a lot of them are because if you normalize things right, and work in z-score so that you have natural scales for things, you do better. Right? So this is called atom. It's not quite this. There's another step that it's not really important for anything. You can look in the notes if you want to. But the idea now is I've taken these things, and in particular, you see that this is calculated for each direction separately, this variance and this mean. 
So in each direction, I move in a different way. And it also implements another form of regularization that seems to be important, which is called parameter clipping, which basically is the statement I never want to make really big moves in any direction. Because I don't trust my, I have big stochastic gradient descent, I don't trust really big moves. So it allows me to set a natural scale on which to move and eclipse big, big, big moves. So that's why Adam will give you usually pretty good, not the best performance, but pretty good off the shelf performance. Because it's kind of a risk averse algorithm, right? And I've gotten around, I would really like to use the Hessian, but instead I just use the in covariance. In very, you know, I just use the second moment. So this is basically how we optimize. Yes? Sorry, I can't hear you. Get to louder. Oh, plus epsilon, because this can go to zero. It just, it's just saying there's a minimum variance, right? You want to regularize. You not, want nothing to become really small and blow up. It just says variances that are much smaller than this, I don't take seriously. Second, right? Just a regularizer. Just as a scale, minimum scale on which I'm willing to take the variances seriously. Because sometimes, you, especially with optimization, the variances can get very small, numbers can get very small, and you just like ignore that. <laughs> just a regularizer. Cuts off small things. All right. So that's the first section of all this, which is the optimizer, right? And so, and this is going to be really important because it's the differentiability that's really important for all this. And you see, all these things are going to require us to be able to take derivatives with respect to parameters. Right? This is all, I haven't said anything, I've just told you if I could take a derivative, how should I move in parameter space? Everyone see that? So this can be used. This is why this is a flexible part of every machine learning algorithm, because it's, it's kind of the fun thing is everything is modular. <laughs> yes, Antonio. Yeah. Yes. Well, you, yeah, I think what it allows you to do is it allows you to choose a slightly larger learning rate, but it still suffers from the gradient descent because you're not, remember, the problem, the biggest problem was that you were set by the smallest learning rate, right? By adaptively putting this thing, you do it like that. What's interesting is that you really need these to have the same dimensions. So a lot of people were saying it wasn't working and they were coding it up wrong, actually, it turned out. So it's really the signal to noise ratio. But I think the way you should think about it is you're allowed to use much bigger learning rate. You become much less sensitive to learning rate because you're working in a dimensional ratio and you're doing that. You're not really solving the correlation problem. What you're solving is the learning rate problem. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's how I think about it. <laughs> All right. So the second ingredient we need is the cost function. All right. So the cost function, how much time do I have? 15 minutes. All right. Wait, this ends at 11, 12, 15? No, 12? 12, 20. 12, 20, OK. OK, OK. No problem. All right, let me clean some boards up. Uh -uh. All right, so there's basically two common cost functions. The cost function is, again, whatever you want to do. We're just going to talk about the simplest classification problem. But almost at the top of all classification problems, right, is you have two kinds of data. You have categorical data, which means things are categories. <laughs> Right, cat, not cat, MNIST, zero through nine. Or you have continuous data.
I hope that's spelled right. I don't know. Can't tell. <laughs> My slight, I, I'm slightly dyslexic, and whenever I'm on a board, I just can't see anything. <laughs> um, so categorical data. For continuous data, the most common thing people use is that you have some prediction that's continuous. And you just, again, the most common thing you use is least square error. All right? But you can use anything you want. The important point, really, is that you want whatever cost function, right? The cost function in general is going to be something that depends on y and something that depends on your predictions, right? So this y hat is your prediction. That's just general standard thing. And you want to make sure this cost function, right? Because of the chain rule, you want the cost function to be differentiable with respect to y hat, because that's how I take the derivative with respect to theta from chain rule. So any differentiable cost function works. And people have clever, in more complicated things, people have more, more you know, whatever, more complicated things. But generally, these squares will give you most of the intuition you need. Categorical data is a little bit more fun. all right, And it's actually very physics inspired. So in categorical data, and this is, you know, the inspiration for this is, of course, regression. So who knows what, if I, if like off the shelf statistics and I have to do categorical data, what kind of statistical model? Pots. Huh? Pots? That's very hard. Not, not usually, but <laughs> it's a good guess. It's something like a Pots model, actually, but it's logistic regression. How many of you have heard of logistic regression? OK, you should go look up logistic regression. It's not going to be really important for what we do, because OK? So the standard thing is logistic regression. So let me tell you how logistic regression works. And, and in general, logistic regression slash soft max regression. So this is usually two variables, two categories. But this is general, many categories. Let's say M categories. All right. I was going to explain to you the relationship between this and maximum likelihood, but I'm hoping it was already done. Uh, there's actually fun things that we're not going to get to because it makes the regularizers make much more sense. <laughs> but the basic idea is that imagine I have some data set, D, and now my data set is going to consist of you know, some features that I measure, x, you know, the pixels in MNIST or whatever you want to say, and some variables y. And in general, it's useful to just say y. You know, so I have some features xi, some predictions. And let's first start with the case where it's a binary variable, 0 or 1. And the basic idea of all this stuff is that I basically define the probability of yi equals 1 given some x to be equal to 1 plus e to the minus w dot x. Right? Oh, or let me use theta. Sorry. Let me use these parameters. Right? And let me use, let me use it like this. Theta dot x. So my parameters are just take my theta dot x and just do 1 plus that. That's the probability of being 1. So instead of thinking about predicting either 0 or 1, generically, you make this problem what's called soft. So instead, you just try to predict the probability that I'm in each of these categories. And many of you will recognize this as a Fermi function. Right? It's just a two-level system. And this theta is the difference in the energies of the two levels. Right? What does this function look like? It, it kind of looks like this, right? It's a Fermi function. It's a sigmoid. Right? And of course, the probability of 1 is just 1 minus the probability of yi equals 1 given x. Right? So this is, this is how I define it. And now what I do is I can write the 
Now what I can do is something that has been already talked about a lot in the lectures, is I can do maximum likelihood estimation. Right? I can say, what's the probability of observing the data given my parameters? Well, it's just going to turn out, so if I call this sigma of uh, sigma of x dot x dot theta, like this, right? So sigma is just this sigmoid function. Then it's just going to be sigma, right, to the product over all the data points that I have times sigma of theta dot x to the yi times sigma of uh, 1 minus sigma of theta dot x to the 1 minus yi. Why? Because yi is either 0 or 1. So the probability to observe a data point is either theta or 1 minus theta. And you see, one of these terms is always 0. Because y, if yi is equal to 1, then I only get this thing. This is the probability yi equals 1. But if yi is equal to 1 or, or 0, then this disappears, and I only get this term. And since the data points are all independent, I can, the multiplying of the data point, the data probability of the data set is just the product for each data point. Right? But what I usually do is I don't work with likelihoods. I work with log likelihoods. Everyone okay with log likelihoods? Right? So I take the log of this thing, and if I take the log of this thing, you see what I get is I get that this is equal to i equals 1 to n, yi log of sigma x dot theta plus 1 minus yi log of 1 minus sigma x dot theta. Right? All I did was take the log likelihood. But now, look, if I look, this is what I maximize, but the cost function is minus the log likelihood, because cost functions are minimized. So minus log likelihood, which is the cost function, looks like this. And hopefully, many of you recognize this as an entropy formula. This is like, if I have a binary variable, right? the entropy of a binary variable it's just minus p log p minus 1 minus p log 1 minus p. Right? That's the entropy of a binary variable that can have probability heads. This is something called the cross entropy, which is related to the kullback leibler divergence. Remember, the kullback leibler divergence is pi log q over pi, because I know you guys covered this. And the part that depends on q is just pi log qi, sum over i, minus the entropy. But this is the part that compares these things. So this is called the cross entropy. And it's because if qi is the only part that has parameter dependence, if I'm going to take derivatives with respect to it, this is the same as taking the derivative with respect to the kullback leibler divergence. Right? So I mean, if qi is the only thing that depends on theta, then if I want to take the derivative of the kullback leibler divergence, that's the same as taking the derivative of this thing. So this is called the cross entropy. And you see that like Q is basically I have the probability from the model, and I compare that to the deterministic probability of the real data. Right? So in some sense, it's calculating the KL divergence between the data labels and my labels. And this is the standard categorical thing. So you can, I'm running out of time, so I won't tell you how. You can general, it generalizes in a very straightforward way to m categories instead of 2, using something called softmax. Right. So maybe I have time. I can, I can show you how it works.
right? So the basic idea, again, is this is this loss function, and it comes from maximum likelihood. But it also looks information theoretic, which is not a coincidence, because you can think of this as a variational free energy. It doesn't matter. If you want all this subtlety, you can go read the review. For your purposes, that's the, whenever you see cross entropy, it's maximum likelihood, it's categorical data. It'll show up tomorrow. And what's fun is, of course, I can generalize this to M categories. And the basic idea is I use what's basically a partition function. So now I have data set, again, Uh, that's not what I wanted to do. I wanted to write it like this. Y i equals 0, 1, 2, all the way to m. So if I have m categories, the y i can be, what I do is generally I make what are called one hot vectors. Another thing you'll see a lot in machine learning, but it's, it's, it's very dumb, which is that instead of representing this as m numbers, I represent this as a vector of length m, and if something is in category 1, I put a 1 on the first category, and everything else is 0. If something is in category 2, I just basically put a 1 at the second thing, and everything else is 0. Category 3, it's in the third thing. Category 4, it's in the fourth thing, all the way to the mth category. All right. And what's nice is that in terms of these y, i, m, so now everything gets two indices, an index i that runs over data points, and an index m that runs from one to the number of categories I have. And what's nice is just like before, now in soft map regression, what you do is that you can write the probability of a given y m prime equals 1 given x. And now what you do is you put a set of parameters for each So now what you have is you have a set of weights for each of the categories. Right? So now if I have, you know, if I have M, if I have NF features, and I have, so these X's are vectors of length N, and I have M categories, now I have NF times M parameters. Right? So you get a different parameter for each category, and it's basically a Boltzmann distribution. Right? This is the probability of being in a given category. It's just a Boltzmann distribution like this. And you can go through, and the same derivation we did right here, you can basically do the same derivation again, and you'll get another cross entropy. All right, since I'm running out of time, maybe I'll just show you. Oh, dang it. I'll, I'll make it take longer, since we're running out of time. Apparently, you can't stop it in the middle. Oh, is it not stopping? Uh-oh. <laughs> I broke the screen. Anyway, I'll just show you the formulas. I hate showing bunches of formulas, but it looks the same. It's not really important for anything you do. All right. So the final thing I, I guess I should say in the last five minutes is what kind of regularizers do I do use? So we already talked about one form of regularization is that we use SGD, right? But often what people also do is that there's many kind of generic regularizers, but one of the things people try to do is set as many parameters to zero as possible. And the way you do that is you take your normal cost function, whatever it is, and it depends on some parameters theta and your data.
And what people often do is they add a penalty for making the parameters too big. All right. So what you say is, let's, you know, the most common functions are alpha equals, uh, well, let's just start with weight decay. So the most common thing is you put an L2 penalty on this thing. So you put an extra parameter lambda, that becomes another hyperparameter. And then you try to basically shrink, right? So this thing says the cost goes up whenever the parameters are big. And so you try to shrink the parameters to zero. And in general, you can have the most common ones are L2 penalties, or you can have what are called L1 penalties, where you take the absolute value of these things. These tend to give you sparse things. But generally, you put extra terms in the cost function to penalize the parameters. All right? And the basic idea, again, is because I don't really care about the training error. I care about the test error. So I want to put in extra terms that basically penalize using too many parameters. Right? And these are penalties on having too many parameters. Because if the parameter is big, it costs a lot. So I have to make sure every time I add an extra parameter, the cost function goes down sufficiently. And that ratio is set by this lambda, which generally is another hyperparameter like the learning rate you have to choose. Right? So this is, in, for some reason, these L2 and L1 penalties in the neural network literature are called weight decay. So if you ever say, if you read a neural network paper, you'll see people say, I use weight decay. That's just adding these penalties. All right? And there's many more things that are very neural network specific that I won't get into. Dropout, batch norm. Right? So I'll just tell you some names of things that are meant to regularize. So another thing is dropout. Another thing is batch norm. And these are just different tricks that people have for regularizing. But the fundamental reason is that you need all this regularization is because you don't want to overfit the data. All right. you can, you know, we, uh, in the review, there's a long list anywhere you look up. right? So that's basically. We're at the point now where, believe it or not, you can write a where we're going to need about 10 more minutes to explain to you how neural networks work and how black prop works, about 30 minutes, the first 30 minutes of the next class. Because we haven't said anything about this function f yet, right? Except we know that we need the cost function to be differentiable as a function of f, and we want f to be differentiable as a function of theta, and we want, to be computational, we want it to be really computationally easy to calculate these gradients. Because we have to calculate the gradients with respect to all the parameters all at once every time we take a gradient descent step. So we'll start here tomorrow. And we'll talk about why neural networks are really good. The thing about modern neural networks is they're designed in such a way that it's really easy to take these gradients and calculate them quickly. Right? And then you plug it into this whole network. You, put a regular, you throw some regularizers in. You throw, choose an optimizer, and then you go let it run with some mini batches and stuff. All right, so we'll do that with the Python notebooks tomorrow. So I take 30 minutes more of explaining this thing, then you can write some deep learning models, and I promise you if you spend another couple of weeks, you can actually understand what's going on in state of the art. Most of the state of the art stuff is not so hard conceptually. It's that they have big computers, they get to empirically play a lot, there's a clever idea. I don't mean to dismiss the ideas. There's often clever ideas, but it's the implementation that matters as much as the idea because you can't tell what's a good idea until you really play with it because there's so many things you have to tune. You have to tune so many hyperparameters, and there's so much hyperparameter tuning, and we'll talk about that tomorrow. That's what real machine learning is about. It's a very empirical field. It's numerical experimentation. That's the right way to think about it. So everyone's hungry. I'm out of time. Thanks. Before we heading towards the uh, cafeteria, do you have any question? Just one or two. Uh, if
not, then we can have uh, some uh, more. If you can ask a question uh, during the lunch break, 